Welcome for another Café Rollist. Uh, I'm here in London in Tier 4. I did not fled, flee from the city like many people yesterday. I'm still here like a proper Londoner. But today I am receiving people from Pacific Time, which is always the, the most challenging of time to have guests with. Could you introduce yourselves? Yeah, um... Hi, I'm Olivia Hill. Um, I'm a game designer, novelist, and a few other things. Um, I work with um, Machine Age Productions, which is basically just the people that you're talking to um, with some assistance. So, um, Mina. Hi, I'm Mina. <clears throat> I'm a novelist, a game designer, and other things. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm the other half. Um, we make games. Yeah. And, and we're well spoken, as you can tell. It's morning time. <laughs> <laughs> so you were just telling me that your, your day is not going as you thought it would be. Uh, nothing uh, alarming there. It's just uh, seasonal holidays. But one of our ice breaking questions uh, on Cafe Release is what is your routine like at the moment? <clears throat> oh, gosh. Um... So we, we have three small kids, not small, um, and two of them are going half days at, at a ground school, and then the other one is at, a, you know, an internet school to, you know, fight the plague and everything. Um, so we drop the two little ones off at school, and then we go and we go to an office, and we write as fast and as hard as we can, and then we eat frozen lunch, frozen, we microwave frozen lunch, and then we come home, and that's like... I guess there's a lot of stuff in between there, but that's it. <laughs> yeah, and then usually the you know the the evening is um, other things, video games. It's yeah, Stardew Valley and a little bit of that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> whatever else. But yeah, our our day is pretty simple. We 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 um, meet with um, our graphic designer usually mm -hmm. in the mornings. Yeah, um, and mm -hmm. we write a lot because we produce a lot of material. Did you pick up any new hobby, interest, or skills uh, as a result of the uh, the different lockdowns uh, and situations going on at the moment? Our hobby is, is that we work. <laughs> um, <laughs> we we actually we ended up um, we ended up working outside of the office, which it's not a really a or out of the home. Um, it's not really a hobby, but we got an, an external office because of this basically we are cooped up with the children at all times oh. and it's sometimes hard to produce yeah so we we got an office outside of the home that way we can go and be isolated and not have to worry about you know should i be picking up our clothes off of the floor or whatever right. instead of working and it's better on them because if we're home all day then we're nagging them about oh you could clean this up oh you could do this have you done your homework not, yeah. not that i sound like that but you know so it's interesting you you for a lot of people it's been the other way around they've been pushed inside their home but your your home used to be your your workplace and you had to find some other office where you can work as a result of the the lockdown yeah yeah because we both had to find an office and find an office that was safe to go to which was its own home nightmare but yeah it's pretty isolated which is nice but yeah we we're used to working at home but that was mostly because the children were away at all all days at school we were living in japan and school there is like it's really an all-day affair yeah. um the kids got home after dark they left before the sun came up yeah and we didn't have to worry but we had a very very quiet very serene setting but now the kids are home most of the day yeah. um, if not all of the day and so you and know they need to be kids they don't need to be told you have to be quiet i'm trying to write a novel like nobody wants to hear that they especially that for means. eight hours a day yeah yeah it's not fair to them <laughs> So I find it, uh, while well, jumping into High Hunt and uh, Machine Age, I find it very uh, interesting that you have the, the two sides of it. You've got the, the games and the novels. Uh, did you split that 50-50 between the, the two of you? Is Olivia more game while Philomena is more novels? I mean, that was kind of originally the idea, but... Um... Liv can churn out a novel in no time when she gets it in her head to do so. So the core novels that base, we base I Hunt off of are her novels. Um, I've written one tie-in piece and I'm working on a second, but um, <clears throat> we, we end up 
splitting it, everything 50-50 ultimately. Um, I mean, graphic design, I don't mm. touch because no. <laughs> um, and Liv works with Francina mostly on that stuff. But beyond that, like I do, like every other supplement, it feels like I do most of, I do the heavy lifting on one, she'll do the heavy lifting on another. So it's basically kind of toss back and forth who's doing what so that there's always some part of production being done. Yeah, we're always adapting and it just depends on what we're doing at the time. Like it's um, it's it's me and Philomena and then we have Francita doing graphic design stuff and we're always doing things. Um, so like, it just kind of depends on the needs of what we're doing. I also do most of the marketing stuff, yeah. but then Philomena also does some of that too. Like we, we really, we, we just kind of share the workload depending on where we are at the time. So, I hunt, uh, for people who are not aware of it, what is it actually? Is it first the novels okay. or then the games and uh, what is it about? So, okay, so it started off, I, I wrote a vampire novel called Blood Flow um, that was just sort of a, it was supposed to be a one and done thing. Um, but it, people really liked it and I wanted to write more, but I didn't want to do another vampire novel. So I wrote this book called I Hunt, um, Killing Monsters in the Gig Economy. And it's basically, um, it, it was a novel that was basically Buffy meets Uber. Um, it was about a, a young woman who um, was hunting monsters on an app called iHunt. Um, and basically it was sort of like the other end of the vampire stories in that world. Um, she was killing the vampires that were the protagonists of the first novel. Um, and people really liked it. And a lot of people were like, when is the game coming out? Um, because, you know, of course they knew that we are game designers. And so they kept asking about that and asking about that. And we were fooling around with it for a few years until yeah. eventually we sort of like hit a stride and decided, no, this is going to be a big thing. Like there's a lot of demand for it. Um, so we went full steam on making the game um, based on the world of the novels. Um, by that, by the time the book or by the time the game came out, there was, um, there was actually like five novels, mm -hmm. um, something like that. I can't remember the exact time it came out. Um, but so that was a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, uh, we have done 14 um, magazine style or zine style supplements for it, yeah. um, which has com um, ended up with two full compilation books. Um, we just um, finished the player's companion for the game. Yeah. Um, like, and Mina's working on another novel. So that'll be the eighth novel in the series. Yeah. Um, and then I'm planning the ninth. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff. Like it's, 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 it's you, a lot. You just made me so tired. Yeah. It's very, <laughs> it's been a very exhausting year, but it's been our most productive year by far. I guess so. That sounds, yeah, amazing <laughs> amount of work just within one year because I was aware, you know, when I too was, well, first of all, I love the premise when I first read about it of I earned, but then I saw there were a lot of, of support for the game because a lot of interesting game often nowadays I found are one-off. So it was really cool to see that you were releasing a, a lot of supplements, but uh, at some point, true that i did not realize it was only one year old yeah yeah well it's it, i think that's because of the model that we're using um like the game is a year old obviously the novels are a little older i started doing those in 2015 yeah um but the um the, the game has been out for a year and every month we release one of those zine supplements sometimes we do two it depends like yeah. we've done bonus ones um and so it feels like there's a lot because we've Put out like 14 of those yeah. and there are all kinds of weird topics yeah um so that like it really feels like a living game um and a lot of people like you know the supplements are very short they're like between 16 and 30 pages depending on when they released basically yeah. and so people will sit down and they'll re read one you know one day out of the month uh and it just sort of updates the world and gives them a little little taste of what's going on um but in the end, they're not very long, so we're not breaking our back on it. We're always able to do other things. It's like a week long, you know. Yeah, from yeah. Start to end. Yeah, we spend about a week on each one of those uh, supplements, and that frees us up for the rest of the month to do other things. Well, and one of the things that you do as a game designer sometimes is you run the risk of like trying to put too much into the core game, where mm -hmm. it's like, oh God, wouldn't this be cool? Oh man, you know what we should do. And rather than like drive ourselves crazy 
erasing these cool ideas, we, we keep a list of them. And then when it's time to do a new supplement, we go through the list and go, oh, hey, you know, we could work that out into a thing. Mm-hmm. And so basically it's, it's saving all those weird little plot bunnies for something external yeah. so that when, the, when we make the games themselves, they can be a lot more laser focused and a lot more. Um, I think it's a, okay. it's a, yeah, I think it's a great format because the the last the last Kickstarter book I received was, uh, you know, they had several goals and they expanded expanded the core book. And uh, in truth, when I got the core book with its hard cover and it was thick like that, it just turned me yeah. off immediately. I was like, I I cannot read that. I cannot take it with me mm. on holiday. And it seems like a drag to read all of that. So the idea of you have your nice little core book with what you need to play and then you have supplements to play specific things you might want to explore. I think it's a, it's a very, very cool model as a reader. I find it very appealing. And it, it frees up the audience to decide, well, I don't care for this particular supplement, so I don't have to use it. Like if you don't, if you don't think, if, so we did one that was about cats believe it or not, and it actually holds together. It sounds silly when you just say it out of context, but we did one that's all about cats and weirdness and 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 um, mem culture almost. Yeah. Um, it makes sense in context. But <laughs> if you were to pick that up and go, this is this is silly. This this means nothing to my hardcore game about millennials fighting monsters. You don't have to use it because it's not in the core book. It's not your problem. You know, it's all supplementary. Yeah, I, I I think that's it. Yeah. yeah. I guess the other aspect which I find interesting is you move towards, and it's a model I've seen with things people would be very surprised. Uh, you move towards a subscription model, which is something which is happening with a lot of industries at the moment. Even even lighting. The the example I always give is Philips. They don't sell light bulbs anymore. They they sell light and subscription to light to businesses and i see a lot of game designers adopting the subscription model often with one page rpgs but uh i don't remember which big company announced recently that they, they were moving towards this model um uh, yeah is it did you move towards that towards necessity or was it something which you to match the way you develop those games or which one came first uh, if any well okay so we came from other places. Like we've worked in the industry for about 15 years now. We worked with like White Wolf, Catalyst, Green Ronin, uh, Paizo, Margaret Weiss, all over the place. Um, millions of words in print between us. And the books that we made there, you know, of course you have your core books, which are these things that take like, you know, a few years to develop. And it's just this hard, 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 hard work. And then you have supplements, which would take like a year to make. Mm-hmm. Um, it would take like three months to write, um, the, then a two month editing process, another two months um, of, of revisions, and then you would um, send it over to layout. And like, it used to be a joke that like, um, it would be this, the amount of time it would take to gestate a baby. Um, it would usually be nine months from start to finish, but then it got longer and longer as logistics changed in the industry. Uh, we stopped being able to like do traditional prints for everything. Things moved to, um, you know, print on demand. Um, layout became a bigger slog as technology changed and stuff like that. And demands changed. Production values changed. Um, and so we got to the point where sometimes we were making games or we were making supplements and things, and we wouldn't see those for two or three years afterwards. And even the nine month thing is a little bit exhausting because you spend all of this time with your brain on that one thing. And we really prefer to sort of like, instead of spending 300 pages talking about where a vampire sleeps or whatever, we prefer to spend 16 pages talking about cats and mem culture, like, and then moving on. That's the important thing is, is that we always get to like, whatever's fresh on our mind, we get to move on and do that thing. And that way we never get bored. We never get burned out. Yeah. Um, And then the sort of the added benefit of that is, is that at the end of a six month period, we take all of these zines, usually seven of them, 
um, because we do about six and a bonus one. We'll take those seven zines, um, we'll pack them in with some new content, like you know some essays and whatever. And then at the end of the six months, we have a full hardcover book full of new, uh, full of content. Right. Um, so if people want big eight and a half by 11 RPG tomes, like they can get those every six months, we're going to make one of those, but we don't have to, to produce in the way that we would to make those normally. Mm -hmm. I guess in terms yeah. of, go, sorry, go ahead, uh, Mina. Uh, yeah, there's, there's an aspect too of like tongue in cheek, detenuement kind of stuff. Like, um, I might've used the wrong word, but let's pretend I used the right word. Like all of I hunt is making fun of corporate culture in one way or another. So like all of our art is stock art. That's both because that was a cheap way to do art and because it's funny as heck. Um, all of our, like our marketing is often like we're making direct fun of another company's marketing and just being very cynical about their approach to marketing. Um, subscription models, like of course we had to do a subscription model because even our light bulbs are going to subscription model, like you said. Um, so, you know, I think we, we try to do it. We actually do the back end of it very fairly to our audience. Like you can still buy all of these supplements and, you know, we, we have a pretty big culture of giving away books to people who need it. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, we do make fun of the kind of, you're just renting our game book and we, you only have a license to it. And, you know, that kind <laughs> of nonsense. Uh, yeah, it's uh, so th those supplements. I believe one of the latest one you published or you were about to publish. Uh, I thought it was so. I and sounds like at first at least sounded like like a very millennial centric game uh, in uh, you know centered on the gig economy. And I saw Olivia, you were tweeting about uh, supplements being about more about the the boomers. Uh, is it yeah. a supplement to come or which has been released yet? And can you tell us a bit about that? It actually just released um, the, on the first of this month. So it's been, it hasn't been very long. Um, and it's, um, and it's, um, it is, a, it's about boomers and it's about um, like holiday stuff. It's weird. Uh, we wanted to do a holiday special and we wanted to do a book about boomers um, but we had to um, we had to sort of combine them because of the way that our schedule was working and so basically the whole book looks like a um, one second I'm sorry one second take your time Yay, being at home means dealing with the things at home that you pretend that you don't deal with when you're a professional. Yeah, well, I'm lucky uh, our son is still uh, at the nursery uh, today. Uh, the nursery uh, wow. are not closed despite the, the current state of things. So we are we're enjoying a, a few days. Uh, my wife is just outside of the webcam. She doesn't like it very much being in the room when I stream, but uh, she's, she's oh. giving me the finger. So... <laughs> Thank her for her service. Thank her for her assistance. Uh. <laughs> I'm trying to my best to monetize my hobby since I'm unemployed since right. January. Oh, you've got to make money on your hobbies. Yeah, if you can't have any fun that doesn't involve profit, that would be horrible. <laughs> I had uh, sessions with a counselor for the first time and uh, I was telling her about my hobby and <laughs> she was asking me if I could monetize it because a lot of my problems related with being unemployed. And I was like, no, no, I cannot talk about that with you, <laughs> not you. <laughs> it's not It's not that easy. It, uh, it doesn't, doesn't really, really work like that. Uh, but yeah, Mina, we... I shouldn't be the only one filling up why Olivia is uh, doing whatever in the background. <laughs> what, what can you say about the recent supplement or any topic you want, really? Um, yeah, so with the Boomer supplement, it was just, okay, so first of all, monetizing um, everything. Uh, we, we, we greatly support people streaming our game, and we like seek out ways to help people streaming our game. And that is because that is such a good way to build audience and build attention. And one of the things that we, we did recently is we had somebody stream a game 
And we were so deeply inspired by their choice to include one of the character's dads as another character. So it was a group of millennials fighting a monster for money and their dad who didn't really know what was going on. He was just trying to be supportive of his daughter. It was adorable. It was the cutest freaking thing. And I was like, you know, we need to do a shout out to the cool boomers because there's like four of them and like they deserve it. You know, <laughs> they had some hard times. Um, so like kind of inspired by him and it also inspired a little bit by people who instinctively go towards jobs that are um, that you'll find you make these these games about, okay, go kill the monster. And you still have players who are like, well, okay, but I want to do one where you don't have to kill the monster. And then, you know, I want to do one where you have to kiss the monster. And, you know, so we support those styles of play. And it just seemed like if we were going to do a boomer book, then we also needed to do like something a little holiday -y, and we needed to do something that supported like, so there's a job creation engine in there specifically to give you Hallmark holiday movies or Christmas holiday movies for your series of adventures over the over the holiday break with your hunters. Because, you know, and basically they're they're non, you know, you don't have to kill anything necessarily and they all of the beats and the pacing of it gives you the feel of like one of those. And then we all learned a really valuable lesson about ourselves, but like done in an I hunt cynical way. Yeah, it's you know it's in, it's interesting that the two ended up being fused in a in a supplement, the holidays and boomers, because the other, the other day we were we were baking with my son and we we put on some Christmas music, and and all of that is very it's kind of quaint and old, you know, it's it's sort of silent generation, boomer generation, or all of those songs. So and I, often songs are the things which inspire me. Uh, adventures to run for role playing games, and yeah, I, I could. I was I was trying to imagine how you could have scenes with those mu with that music in the background. The, the holidays is something which I don't know. The the millennials have not really made their own. I guess it's it's. I guess it's because yeah. quite simply it's related to the past rather than the present and a certain nostalgia. So all those values are are very boomer like i assume yeah 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 i i think um i think it's been it was tradition for our parents and for us it's like kind of like mimicking a tradition that we don't totally understand hmm. like you were you were asking about things new hobbies that we picked up over the over the the thing i didn't pick up any new hobbies per se but a thing that i found myself craving to do was to make my grandmother's recipes. Like I, I desperately wanted to make the Christmas cookies that my grandmother made. And, you know, we went through the process of figuring those out, even though I didn't really have the recipes, I had names for things. So I had to do a lot of like internet research. And I feel like some on some level, there's this weird gap between us and our parents' generation where like, we didn't get handed down the tradition of making those things. We only got handed down the tradition of remembering that those things existed. Yeah, there's sort of I, a yeah. connection happening, I guess, between... I mean, I'm, technically, I'm a xenial, uh, if that means anything, but yeah, 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 yeah. It, it feels like the younger generation connects with not their parents' generation, but their parents' parents' generation more often mm. th than not, because I guess there were traditions, and often our parents' tradition lost those traditions because they entered a more consumerist lifestyle where you would buy food, for instance, or, or baked goods rather than bake them yourself. So uh, there's this kind of this... Uh, appeal of trying to do uh, what our grandparents uh, were doing. There, there's definitely something on on my side. My mother didn't cook or bake uh, much because she she didn't have time to. Uh, but that's something yeah. my grandmother did a lot. So so yeah, it's it's weird how we connect to to older people even than uh, than the boomers. Yeah, yeah, and I I think I think. You know, we, we shit on boomers because we can, because they're in charge and they're ruining everything. But like on a lot of levels, they had a real rough time too. You know, they're they're baby boomers because they were part of the post-world 
um, everybody's excited, let's have a bunch of babies and do the things that make babies. And, you know, then they got hit with, you know, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, they had the 60s, so they could have changed the world. And then they didn't. Instead, they they got corporate gigs and 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 like kind of bought in. And like, that's got to kill you. Like, that's got to destroy your soul. You know, and so you got to imagine there are a lot of people who did what they had to do to survive, but like, you know, they could have been hippies. They they know what they should have been doing. Mm -hmm. So they had to like kind of even sell out their own soul oh, yeah. to get to that point. Hey, Olivia, you, you had a nice, interesting tweet. Uh, at some point, I remember you tweeting that, for instance, uh, the, the Stonewall generation, they were boomers. They were, of course, yeah. so of course they were not millennials, but when we discuss things in generation terms, uh, it we tend to forget that. Yeah, I think that there's a sort of concept of, of what a boomer is, and it's very, like, propagandized by classic television and by politics even you yeah. know we talk about boomers and really what we're talking about is men um usually white um cisgendered hetero of a certain age sometimes women um it but in you know in a very subservient role both yeah, as their wives yes as their wives right, right um and so you have this sort of this idea of the the sort of penultimate like uh, American nuclear family and whatever. And those, th that's boomers, but really like boomers were just as like not white and just as queer and just as diverse as all of us. Um, millennials didn't invent non-white people. Um, and we often we certainly didn't invent, invent gayness. That's yeah. Sure. Yeah. Like Cole Porter was doing that shit in the twenties. Like, um, <laughs> so I really wanted to hit home on that and, and note that like, not all boomers are like regressive forces in the world. It's just that the ones that you hear about today, the voting block basically, mm. um, can be, but there's also a lot of really cool ones. So we really wanted to hit home on the cool ones. Cause you know. That's we, that's who we sympathize with. Yeah. One aspect I find fascinating with I Hunt, uh, it, it sort of mirrors a, a frustration I have with entertainment in general. Uh, I guess it's because the you know with uh, mainstream media the, there's a there's a very slow cycle for people to be in in charge to make the decision the creative decisions and, and so on. But I find there's very little works which reflects the now or do proper anticipation based on today uh, there's a lot of retro futurism uh when you look at the the star wars the star trek even the uh i mean been talking so much hearing so much about cyberpunk recently none of these seems yeah. to actually acknowledge what's the situation now what's the technology like today and i find it very interesting that i hunt just does that it really takes something you you said buffy in the gig economy but that that's it really it really feels like in the now the near, near future this idea of using apps and smartphones uh and current ideas that uh, we see uh, uh in the the streets uh so yeah what 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 do you have to say about the anticipation sort of aspect or current days aspect of of i hunt well, so when when I was coming up with I Hunt, whenever I first started writing the novel, the reason why I wrote it was because of a story about, um, you know, mogul and bajillionaire Peter Thiel, um, awful, awful guy. Um, Peter Thiel uh, was talking about how he buys blood from young people um, and basically runs young people's blood through his body in order to prolong his life um, that's not a, that's a real thing that's this, not yeah. part of our fiction that's this, a real world real thing you can google it yes this is a real <laughs> thing uh, peter teal is a vampire He's literally a vampire and in the day, um, you know, Karl Marx talked about, you know, a specter haunting Europe, and he talked about how the capitalist is a vampire draining, um, you know, the, the alienated labor from the people and whatever. And so this, I felt that there needed to be a modern answer to that concept. And Peter Thiel uh, is, is it. 
and the gig economy is it it's working people to the bone and yeah. killing them and with like only enough to keep them alive sometimes yeah um as the reward and it's funny because i wanted to write something that was hyper modern that was like un that was so modern that like it felt like it couldn't be real and what's funny is is that i get a lot of people coming to me and they say you know this is modern cyberpunk this is what cyberpunk should grow into and my my first response is but it's not because it's just 2020 it's just now um and the reason why it feels like a modern answer to cyberpunk is because all of the things that we associate with, you know, cyberpunk and whatever, they've come and gone. Uh, and the, the things that cyberpunk predicted have already passed. We, we're already there. Um, the stuff that you see in cyberpunk and in Shadowrun and everything, that's just the gig economy. That's just Uber. <laughs> like the way that corporations are literally like wielding political power to um, destroy labor laws and to enact their own like private security armies. We yeah. have that. Yep. That's, that's, you know, that's Blackwater, that's G, that's all of these things in the world. Yeah. And so if you're telling stories about that, they're going to feel dated. They're going to feel like George Bush era fantasy. Right. And that's not that's not futurism to me. That's not, that's not giving a stark warning. That's telling us what we already have and telling us, but be careful because if you don't do what we say, then you'll have this. Well, bitch, I already have that. Right. Like that's the world we've got. We don't have cybernetic arms. Yeah. We don't have cybernetic arms. That would be the cool part. Like <laughs> we, we, have, cool parts. we have all of the bad parts, but we don't have the cool parts of those worlds. And so, so you can't, I don't feel like you can effectively tell those stories in that way mm -hmm. uh, without, without addressing the way that the, that culture has moved. Yeah. And that's, that's why I hunt feels more futuristic than modern. Yeah. But it is, it is extremely modern. And like, the thing is when we find, when you find yourself writing for a traditional publisher, you'll find yourself going, oh, I can't use that reference. That's going to date this too strongly. Yeah. For us now nah, to heck with that. No problem. Um, I will put in a mem I saw this week while I'm writing, and I know that by next week when the game is released, the mem won't be a mem anymore, and I don't care. It's fine. Well, the, there's a sort of, there's a recursive nature to internet culture and to mems and things like that. Like in the iHunt book, um, there were a few things that, that I mentioned that I knew were going to be dated by the time the book was finished. Yeah. And I can just, re I can reference that in a tongue in cheek fashion. Yeah. Like I mentioned the 30 to 50 feral hogs thing, right. but I mention it tongue in cheek. And I mentioned the fact that it's going to be a dated reference by the time the book is coming out. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's very like sort of tongue in cheek and it's very fourth wall breaking. Yeah. Um, we were always told in game design, like for like White Wolf and everything, that we shouldn't address the audience with a self-awareness of what we're doing, which is which ultimately comes off as very pretentious. Yeah. Um, it comes off as like sort of self-important and aloof. Mm -hmm. um, because like you're talking about these things and obviously culture moves on and like people get over themselves. Um, but it feels out of time and out of place. And the fact that we address what is exactly right now when we're writing mm -hmm. makes it feel like, no, this is not out of time and out of place. This is a snapshot of time. Yeah. It's it's interesting that, uh, yeah, traditional publishers, uh, they, or they would be against self-awareness because again, if you look in, into the now, I guess, uh, uh, from, I mean, there, there were precedents, but I mean, after Buffy, it's, I find it at be has become very difficult to do f urban fantasy, which is not self-aware, at least a bit. Uh, I yeah. see stuff like Enola Holmes, which seems to be quite self-aware. The, the characters, I mean, there's Deadpool. There, there are a lot of characters, even mm -hmm. without being fourth wall breaking. I mean... Yesterday I was watching What We Do in the Shadows and it has this <laughs> mockumentary format which has been there since at least The Office and it's now and now it's so common that we don't even notice it anymore. It's, it's a bit weird when they address uh, the, the camera crew and so on. But yeah, everything seems so self-aware and it feels very difficult to s introduce something about vampires, zombies, 
without anyone mentioning, wait, is that some kind of interview with the vampire bullshit or is it Twilight? Right. What mm -hmm. is going on here? Right. Yeah. And it's very liberating to write in a modern setting about monsters and vampires and not be held back by that. I can absolutely write a character in I Hunt who has seen every episode of Buffy and has strong opinions about Supernatural. <laughs> like, I can just do that. It's fine. Nobody's going to tell me, oh, that's a little goobery. That's a little weird. Mm. Because it would be, it's ridiculous to ignore the, the real world for the sake of your real world setting. Like, you can't do that. Mm. I think the closest that we've come is that we have, by and large, decided that we're not going to approach um, COVID directly in our main game. Yeah, we do have some material on like living in a time of pandemic, but we don't address it directly as COVID. Yeah. Um, just because like for one, we don't know like when it's gonna end. Yeah. And for another, we don't want to we don't want to encourage people to play some through something that is currently hurting them. Yeah. Yeah. COVID uh, is but other than that, go ahead, yeah, go sorry. Ahead, please. Uh, no, no, please go ahead. Uh, COVID is a is a weird one. I mean it, I mean, just in terms, it's it's a it's a tragic situation. But when you you step back and you start at looking something like entertainment, it, it's it's really weird to think how entertainment's gonna cope with that. Uh, again, especially think yeah. with a, a, a slow cycle. First of all, we got a lot of movies which were produced before COVID, so they're gonna come out telling a story which is without COVID or before COVID, and now. They start slowly to produce more movies, but what do they do about that? Do they acknowledge it in a world like something very popular, the Mar Marvel Cinematic Universe? Do people start wearing masks? So it's it's really weird to think. Yeah. Okay, how much time before it becomes part of the story we tell as well? Like like I was watching not too long ago a video about. The fact that smartphones usually don't appear or are not really items which are active in most story mainstream storytelling because it's it's too recent and just showing a smartphone two years later uh, your movie will will age very poorly. But just just finishing yeah. on, uh, on COVID, what I thought was fascinating with COVID, I had the experience even yesterday. Uh, I remember one of the, not a criticism, but the, the remarks regarding High Hunt was, well, how does that work? How can the world still be like ours if there are vampires and werewolves around? And I believe your answer, I'm paraphrasing, was that, well, look at all the issues that people just ignore. And and yesterday yeah. I was in the street, I went to, to a baker, and, and people are not wearing masks. And, and yeah. the very evening, people are in a panic, people are getting on trains to to leave London in packed trains because they're, they're scared to be trapped here. And it's just they ignore this situation, which is real, but it's too abstract for them, like climate change. Yeah. And on the other end, there are mm -hmm. other issues which you could argue are they real, are they not real, like fishing uh, as part of Brexit here in the UK, which is a non-issue. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry for the fishing co uh, communities in, in the UK, but in terms of scales, it, it really doesn't matter compared to other issues or the scare about yeah. the number of immigrants showing up here. Uh, it, it's interesting with COVID to have an example how of, yeah, a zombie invasion, people would be very slow to react and they would react poorly. Vampires around, yeah, people would be like in Sunnydale, they'll be like, I don't know. That was weird, I guess. It's not my life. It's not my problem, right? Every single person you see out in the streets right now not wearing a mask is somebody who would get bit by a zombie and hide it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, every single one of those people would be the movie, the guy in the movie who mm -hmm. is infected but doesn't tell you until it's too late. Yeah. <laughs> and they're a much bigger percentage than we ever wanted to believe before. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's quite weird. Uh, going back on on I Hunt, uh, a project related to I Hunt, which I too really interested me also because again it felt more self-aware and and contemporary. I don't like the word modern, but that becomes that comes from my training uh, as an architect. Uh, is uh, Savage Garden? Uh, can you what's going on with Savage Garden? Was that a supplement? Is it a, another game coming out? 
It is another game. Mm -hmm. um, it will be coming out probably this year, this coming year, 2021. We're almost at the end of the year. I keep forgetting. <laughs> um, so it'll come out in 2021. Um, and <laughs> it's such a weird thing. Um, it, it's coming out in 2021. And it's a game about the vampires in the world of I Hunt. Yeah. Um, and the sort of the the, the tagline, the, the name that we are working with is Savage Garden. It may not be the final name, but um, Savage Garden uh, living forever in the gig economy. And the point of the game is that like in most vampire media, um, in your interviews of the vampires, your vampires of the masquerade and whatever. <laughs> your vampires, the masquerade. Yes. Is... Um, you have vampires who are considered to be like apex predators. Yeah. Um, they are, they're preying on humanity. They are, they are monsters and whatever. And Some of them have big, strong feels about it. But other than that, they're still murderers. Yeah, they have big, strong feels about the fact that they're murderers, but they're murderers and that they, they're they they're basically, they're parasites. They're leeching off of the world. Mm. Um, and You're still talking about vampires, I, not, not the news or some people making money <laughs> during the pandemic, right? <laughs> well, ah, see, vampires, <laughs> <laughs> vampires are about the news, gosh. Um, so I was thinking about this in terms of um, what it would be like today, because I mean, the first novel that we wrote in the series was the vampire novel, yeah. Blood Flow. Um, and so I, I had a lot of time to think about it. And I realized that in a practical sense, millennials are in a weird position if they if they become vampires they you know someone bites them someone wakes them up from the dead and they're like congratulations you have forever um and to the millennial looking at this they look around and they're like um it's 2020 um i have maybe 15 years if, if climate scientists are correct <laughs> um i there's going to be irreversible damage done to the world and there's going to be an extinction level event within 50 years um that's not really forever and the thing is is that like the vampires of course millennials would be brought into this world they realize oh crap there's a there's a timeline there's a definite deadline on what this world can offer me but then you've got all of these other vampires who are hundreds or thousands of years old and they're like oh it's just a phase who cares we've they, seen this before it's fine they are very much like the people who refuse to wear masks they're just in denial because they've been around for long enough that like obviously nothing's going to upset that and change that Whereas the millennials, the, the younger people of the world realize, no, the world is coming towards a giant big red light. Like we, we are going to see tragedy. We are going to see suffering. And so instead of approaching ga the game from a perspective of vampires being predators, the vampires in Savage Garden are gardeners. They are fostering a new tomorrow. They have to, because if they don't build a better tomorrow, there's no tomorrow for them to have. Um, and so it's like the ultimate millennial irony to be given, given eternal life in a world that doesn't have eternity. It's it, it, it'll be fun. Though. It'll be fun. Yeah. <laughs> I promise. It won't just be depressing. <laughs> but I love it because it be more optimistic. It actually mirrors some stuff I tried to do as a player when I was playing Nephilim or Vampire the Masquerade. I was there's been a couple instances yeah. in which I wanted to play a very sort of practical vampire or, or Nephilim or immortal creature because why why would they you know that being the you know it's a frustration with with leaders and people in power air quotes is that sometimes I find that. They're not smart at being evil. They they don't keep that well the the status <laughs> quo and they they yeah they they got ideologies getting in in the way of actually maintaining stuff in place because stuff are quite yeah. good for them. So why don't they keep stuff for play in place? And at the time yeah the feedback from game master was often no 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 you don't you don't do that or the system is not there to do that or this, the law is not there to to let you do that in the masquerade or in nephilim because reasons and and i think it's at the same time you're mentioning millennial vampire and i would think okay i get the idea it, it totally makes sense the idea oh, we've been wrong we've seen stuff and so on but again we were talking with mina of the old the connection of the millennials with even older generation mm -hmm. uh i would imagine a vampire they've seen stuff first hand I, I'm a big 
somewhat big history buff. I'm listening to something about the the war in the Pacific, World War II right now, and a lot of the experiences and stories from those times are lost to the population. And at least in the past, yeah. I guess we had people who've been through that. I mean, I, I think of people who are not perfect, but you know, people like Gene Roddenberry and a lot of the people in the cast of the original Star Trek, they've seen the war, mm -hmm. they took part to it, mm -hmm. and you can tell in their work. So, and now we're in a generation of, sure, there was the, the Vietnam War, which involved uh, the US, that there's been other wars in, in the US, but it's it's still very distant for, for a lot of Westerners, Europeans, and uh, Americans. What's the reality of such a crisis? So I would imagine vampires would be in true World War One or the fall of Troy, uh, being like, actually, it's quite good right now. We we prefer not to ruin things by taking a chance that uh, everything could be swallowed in the sea. Like, I don't know, remember Atlantis? We, we had a climate crisis <laughs> or whatever, and we were one. And so I, I could imagine all the vampires being also into the, that concept of being, yeah, actually, we could, we could do something about that. Maybe not all of them, but some of them. Yeah. 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 And you'll, you know, we'll have, we'll have mentors and people who are trying in the right direction, but of course you don't play them. You play the, the cool young hip people who are yeah. trying. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I think it's interesting too, to think about like, okay, so sure. A vampire who's been through world war two is going to have some views on, you know, things are good. Let's keep it that way. A vampire who's been through, I don't know, the revolution in Haiti. Mm -hmm. um, he's going to have a real strong opinion about social upheaval and social change because that ruined his whole day. Yeah. And he's going to be real active against things that would cause more revolution. Yeah. And he will, he will invest his time and energy in suppressing those kinds of thoughts Yeah, because he doesn't want to have his castle stampeded by, you know, angry people with pitchforks. Well, and there's something there's something sort of unique about right now with with our younger people. When I say younger, I mean anyone under 40. Yeah, um, well, I'm almost 40. So yeah, I I just <laughs> just drawing a line to exclude me. Thank you very much. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, well, I, like I, that's our age. We, yeah, we're we're technically I'm I'm a zillennial technically. Yeah. I think. Yes. Yeah. You are. You're we we we'll enough. fight for xenial status. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, but so there's there's something there's something interesting and sort of unique um, in this in this time period with the, the younger people of the world and that we have not been adults in a time of prosperity. We became Never. adults in the time of, you know, 9-11. Yeah, the, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, all of this stuff, like the housing crisis, the bubble, um, the, the, dep the, the recession. Yeah. Um, and it's been constant. It has not stopped. It has not let up. So when our parents are like, well, you could just work harder. When I was your age, you know, I worked a part-time job and that's how I paid for college or whatever. We've never had that. No. Like that's never even been a promise for us since we were children. We were, we were children and we were told that we could be whatever what we wanted when we grew up. And then we became adults and things just kept going downhill. They have not stopped. Um, so when they say, oh, there are better things like, you know, you can, you can do better. Like you can, you can dig yourself out of this ditch. Like our generation, there our, our response to that is really show us prove it yeah because there's no generational wealth anymore there's no, no it's all mm. the middle class has been gutted you know it's it's amazing our retirement plan is die young yeah and imagine how that must feel for someone who is just told you can live forever yeah that's savage garden so there you go exciting <laughs> nothing like a good cheerful tabletop role playing game to play well, well okay the difference, the thing that we come back to with like I Hunt and that sort of thing and Savage Garden too, with I Hunt, you do get to murder Peter Thiel. Yeah. You know, you do get to kill the monsters. We, in our real lives, we don't get to kill the vampire that is at the castle that we're trying to escape or whatever. Um, but in a fictional setting like I Hunt, you do. So at least there's that. <laughs> yeah. And in Savage Garden, like it is a garden and it does it does bear fruit. Yeah. We get to see a better tomorrow and we get to make it. Yeah. Um, that's the important part is that like we are working towards something and it's not necessarily a losing battle because in the case of 
Savage Garden, you're you're playing vampires. You're playing characters with superpowers. Yeah. Um. So you can shape that better world. You just have to. So it's a game about people taking like a proactive stance, and like ultimately, the, there will be plenty of support for a very optimistic view of play. And like, not to get too you know up my own butt about this kind of thing, but like, we do believe a better world is possible. We mm -hmm. absolutely believe that we we can embrace the ontology of of good and that we can use direct action to make the world a better place. And there's no reason to make games that don't embrace that. And in fact, in some of our supplements, we give you some hints on how you can learn to do those things yourselves. And I think Savage Garden will be full of suggestions on how you as a player can get out in the world and make the world a better place. Hmm. So, you know, we're, we're, we're both talking theoretical, you know, emotional um gap what do you call it when you let off steam um I, I, I venting yeah yeah it's you know it's emotional venting and that sort of thing but also we want to help you think in terms of no actually it's okay we, we still got a little bit of time yeah absolutely. we can still do absolutely. some stuff yeah and even like we did we did a, um we did a, a zine about social upheaval and eye hunts yeah. and we did spend a couple pages at the end of the book talking about what you can do like direct right action collective community action that you can do um, places you can go things that you can you can address to make your environment better and to help with these issues yeah um like we absolutely believe in a proactive like a uh, 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 productive tomorrow yeah oh in savage garden do you navigate because i imagine so the garden are, are the mortals which you take yeah. care of and uh, i assume you feed upon uh, as a vampire so you, you create a community and again a story buff uh listening to a few xn podcasts i recommend to check martyr made uh at the moment they got a series about uh the, the tragedy which was around uh jim jones uh mm. th there are things like the the manson family i mean uh all of these things add aspects of building a community with uh, ambitions which were manipulated and went the wrong way. But sometimes the, ambi the ambitions themselves might have been more or less positive. Or do you? So I would be very interested to to explore that with Savage Guard. I mean, to explore the idea of creating a community, but at the same time you're vampires, so it's kind of cultish. So it's about all you. Uh, mm -hmm. manage power for the greater good, but there are challenges and there are definitely dark sides to that, especially if you're a vampire. So oh, yeah. do you do you navigate that or maybe avoid uh, to, to fall into topics which are uh, beyond maybe what the framework that you want uh, you want to do with, with that specific oh are you are you going there and it's it's you know you use this the safety practices and tools which are necessary for something as dark but you yeah it's, it's definitely part of the game or oh, oh, does that uh, savage garden might engage with that so the thing about the thing about savage garden and vampires as gardeners is that like you can play a total like good guy vampire like you can play like obviously it's a little complicated like it involves a lot of finding consent with the people you're eating and stuff but you can play someone who is just like altruistically working toward a better tomorrow which is cool but also you have people you have vampires who are working towards a better tomorrow just because of the fact that they need it um it's enlightened self-interest for them um so they will they will take a stark and and efficient path to get there. And sometimes that's going to involve cultish behavior. Sometimes yeah. that's going to involve um, abuse of a community. Um, just because you're building a garden doesn't mean that it's a happy, pretty garden. Um, and we will absolutely be supporting that sort of thing. And it's it, it's sort of interesting, too, that you bring up like Jim yeah. Jones, um, I because I, I find that a particularly fascinating topic. I've read up a lot about it and everything. And and Jim Jones I, and that whole story gets a weird malignment in the media um, because they were working towards economic and racial justice in ways that like you don't even see today. Mm -hmm. um, they were very radical about that. And the tragedy that, that befell them was largely because of interference from the United States and the California government. Um, 
it was because of outside forces. And we get these stories and then we get the, the malignment. And now we have people talking on the internet every day about drinking the Kool-Aid, right. even though that's not actually what was going on. Like that was, that's a very simplified, um, even, even insultingly so mm -hmm. um, simplified version of what happened. Um, but that's the story that we get. And I think that I think that exploring, you know, the reality of people who are taking a radical stance toward building a, a, a new collective future, I think that that's super compelling. And I do want to take every possible angle to it. And you're going to have people who are going to play mm -hmm. vampire. You're going to you're going to tell stories where you are doing your best to make this protected garden for yourself it's inevitable that there are going to be outside forces looking at that and wanting to take it from you. Yeah. And how they try to take it from mm. you and how you respond to those stresses, sometimes it is going to go in a very bad way. And sometimes it's not. Like, that's kind of up to you at the table. I mean, we're playing fate here, so it's not exactly grim, dark. Like, it's there's no insanity mechanics. There's no grim, dark mechanics. It is telling the stories honestly and the set the, the system doesn't necessarily enforce a grim dark approach no um so you know there are some there are some systems that are set up that push the story in that direction regardless we choose a system that allows you to go in that direction if that's what you approve of or not go in that direction if that's not the story you want to tell yeah absolutely we we're close to the one hour mark, but I had uh, one last question. Uh, going back to the the beginning of our conversation regarding the the novels and the games, uh, do you have you seen people getting into I Hunt through the novels and then trying the game, or people who are more, I guess it's more common, gamers would then uh, go into reading uh, novels. Uh, do you think it's uh, it might be a good entry to the the hobby to have uh, those novels? Do you do you have an audience which are more attuned to the novels who, who said, "Hey, I might as well try the game as well." I think that the game is is probably more popular and has pushed more people towards the novels, but they do work in both directions yeah uh, we get a lot of we get a lot of both like obviously the novels um, existed for a few years before the game did um so that was the first point of entry for a lot of people and it was able to get the game to start out strong um if it just sort of dropped on its own it, it wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been what it was um but i do think that that we do get a lot of people who play or who who read the game who play the game and then they're like there's this whole world and they want to get into it so they do pick up the novels and like a lot of times like we've we've had a lot of times where people will play the game and then they'll buy like all seven of the novels and they'll be like i am i am in i'm yeah. i'm 100 yeah. so that is a thing that happens i think that that's probably more common than the other way around um, the novels weren't very big on their own like they're big for an indie release but it's not like they're in like bookstores everywhere or anything right, like that right. but they can be they can be people can order them yeah but yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah the, the the game is definitely the bigger of the two and has funneled more people toward the other okay would you consider turning any of the novels maybe it's already exists i don't know into uh, audio dramas <laughs> Hmm. Do, you, do you want to talk about that? Oh, did yeah, I did I unveil something uh, in the works? You did actually. This makes you do it. This makes me do it. Now I have to, right? Yeah. Um, so you're a big history buff, right? Oh, I am, yeah. Okay. So it turns out that for the next six months, all of our supplements are going to be um, eras in San Gennaro. Oh. So mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're starting with the 1930s. And one of the reasons that we're starting in the 1930s is because I am obsessed with classic radio. Oh, cool. Um, and, and to kind of to vent this obsession of mine, my lifelong dream, um, I'm producing a small radio show series for a hunter in the 1930s of San Gennaro. And as we are releasing in January the 1930s book, we'll be putting out some of those episodes. Yeah. And in fact, the um, the the sort of intro fiction for the 1930s book is probably going to be the first episode script. Yeah, in in traditional in, format and everything yeah, like radio that. radio drama yeah. format. I can hear the 
crackling sound and uh, kind of nosy. Uh, yeah. And no, I'm sorry, I'm entering the house. What is he going to find? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh, you don't know. I I listen to hours of those things every week. Like I can't, I can't stop. It's an obsession. <laughs> no, I love that. I, I love. I find tabletop RPGs are something untapped in to explore history, but you know, not the not the big extra history. The big event is always the stuff we we refer about, and each time we talk about playing in the historical settings, about oh yeah, but what if I change the timeline and so on? It's just there's so many very interesting podcasts which talk about the the life of individuals who might have been celebrities, which are now forgotten. I'm a I'm a big fan of. Uh, you must remember this podcast by Karina Longworth and just exploring different times and uh, the struggle of people at different times is fascinating and yeah. really wants me to to play. And there's so so many very exciting things. I mean, if you want, if I was to suggest a setting for a I Hunt adventure full with cameos, uh, have you heard of? Uh, it's nothing. It's something I never heard of before that that podcast of the hollywood canteen oh. uh, no, no, no. i think you would love that so the hollywood canteen i think it was created by bet davis during the Ooh. war oh my son is, uh, is gonna enter uh <laughs> during the war and it was a place where um uh, veterans well not veterans but active member uh, on duty soldiers during world war ii could come to relax <laughs> In Hollywood, uh, but they would be served in the kitchen, and the waitresses and so on would be actors and actresses. So you would run into a lot of celebrities this way. So this is sort of the yeah. the gilded aspect of it. If you go into the more somber aspect of things, uh, actors and especially actresses might not have been already established actresses. So they were there, asked by their agents to go there to dance with uh, with soldiers. So that's a bit dark. Uh, on the lighter side, yeah. and it, it, there's a funny anecdote about that, is um, so the FBI investigated there uh, for a conspiracy. And the conspiracy was, are people trying to encourage uh, racial integration by having white women dance with black soldiers? Because the Hollywood Canteen mm -hmm. was one of the very few clubs, if not the only club, which was not segregated. And it turns out it was a true conspiracy. Uh, the, I believe it was a communist party was really encouraging that within the, the club somehow. But I, I mean, it's just a tiny little bubble oh, yeah. in history, but you look into it and it's, yeah. it's so fan fascinating and there's so many adventures which can take place in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I love that. I love that. We're, we're skipping the forties. Yeah, we are skipping the 40s because we didn't want to, like, we figured that that's, like, one of the most common things that games address. Yeah. Um, so I I felt like um, that we we could say things about it, but we had six um, six periods to work with, and we wanted to do six that were all in the um, the 20th century for the most part. Yeah. Um, so we're doing, like, the 30s, the 50s, maybe the 60s maybe. as a bonus. Yeah. The 70s. 80s, 90s, we're going to do a near future, uh, which is like maybe 10 years from now, we're going to do, a, we're going to play our hand at doing some prediction. Um, and, and hopefully be laughably wrong. Yeah, hopefully, um, because it'll be, it'll be dark. Um, but yeah, so that, <laughs> that's our plan. And, and the radio show I'm super excited for. Yeah. <laughs> now, now Philomena has to actually to finish yeah, it. I do. <laughs> I'm a terrible reader, but I'm a good listener. So I really uh, look forward to it. Uh, is there anything else you want to add before we part way? And uh, in both cases, uh, what is your goodbye and where can people find you when you wish to be found? We do have one little thing that we wanted to bring up and that's uh, Philomena can talk about it. It's yes. Flatpak. Oh, um, real quickly, I'm doing a, a remake of a game called Flatpak Fix the Future. It's an optimistic post-apocalyptic story. Um, it's fate but you're also bringing in games of cards and Jenga and, and that sort of thing. So it's for a slightly younger audience and you're basically running around fixing things after the apocalypse. It's very uplifting. Yeah, so we're gonna be releasing that in the next couple months. Yes. Um, so that's a thing. And as far as where you can find us, um, so right now, um, if, you're, if you're hearing this right now, then um, 
ihunt.fun yeah. slash gnome, G-N-O-M-E, yeah. um, is our current um, pre-order drive for the iHunt um, physical book. Yeah. Um, it's a big deal. It's a big thing that we're doing through December and into January. Um, but other than that, I would strongly recommend that you check out our Twitter account, which is at Machine Age Inc. Yeah. Um, and our Patreon, which is, you can search Inc. for- Inc as in I-N-C. Yeah, I-N-C, I I yeah, <laughs> Machine Age I-N-C. Um, and our, our Patreon, you can find it's Machine Age Productions. Um, that's where we release all of our, our supplements. That's our subscription model. Um, and the bigger that that gets, basically, the more of that kind of content that we can do. And that's where the yokes are, or jokes are, right? Yeah, yeah, that's where <laughs> that's where they are. So if you want us being really weird and dark and funny and strange, Patreon. And um, if you just want to know what we're doing at any given time, that's the Twitter. Yeah. Amazing. Great. I will put a, a link in the description of this episode. So I recommend everyone to go there and uh, click on them. And I will include links to your products. And if people purchase them, I might have a little thing because as we were saying, we're trying to monetize our hobbies uh, nowadays. So <laughs> uh, yeah, people that uh, subscribe, follow on Twitch. I'm terrible at making those announcement uh, requests. I should do them at the beginning but thank yeah. you so much olivia and uh, philomena uh, it was great having you on and uh, feel free to come back uh, anytime you want to to talk about uh, new supplements for irons or new projects oh dope we totally will thank you so much okay have a good day and okay. thank everyone for hanging out yeah thank you bye -bye. cheers bye